uh, tell us where you guys started out. Um, well, Mark and I started out in a, an acoustic band in uh, Columbia, South Carolina back in 1985. And uh, then we started the band in 86. And uh, we've been playing ever since then, really. Sony joined us in 88, was it? 89? 89. 89. And uh, we just been, that was when we really got serious about it, was 89. Because before we were just doing it for fun. And then everybody got out of college and we wanted to do it seriously. And when Sony joined us, it just seemed to, to work. So we took it serious. Is that when you guys started playing a lot of shows out together in 89? Yeah. That's so when we started really traveling outside of Columbia. Um, mostly during college, we were just playing some local area bars and some uh, fraternity shows and that sort of thing. You know, I guess in like 1990 or 91 is when we really went on the road and uh, you know, we didn't take more than a week off until we recorded our record. And about how many shows did you do in 90 and 94? 200 and something. Yeah, I guess we started out, we were least. doing like two and three nights a week and then up to three and four in 90, 91 and you know, since then. As much as four and five and six a week and yeah. sometimes seven or eight. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's eight. Eight. Yeah. yeah, I mean these days we could play nine nights in a row even though I keep telling you know, our management that I can't physically do that. Just let them play. <laughs> yeah, it, it used to we would go out and do little regional swings and then come home for a few days. Um, and you know, but nowadays we're out for months at a time so it's gradually built into a full scale touring. And is that how you develop your material by getting out on the road? And oh yeah, and that's how you get tighter. That's how it yeah, started. I mean, definitely worked our worked our songs up doing that. We all write all the time and stuff, but it, you know, as a traveling unit, playing every night and going through hard times together and stuff, that's how the band gets tighter and the sound gets tighter and everything. And so I, I mean, it's beneficial to 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 tour even if you're not signed or not doing anything. Uh, on a major level, it's just still good to just tour and keep your set tight. Very good practice. <laughs> so do you write while you're traveling together? In the, in the I think we all write individually. We, yeah, we write individually when we travel, and then when we get off the road or before we do an album, we'll uh, get together and put all our different ideas together and come up with songs. So you've been touring for a while, and you've probably made the same stops in different cities now for a few years. Are yeah. there Friends that you have that you look forward to seeing. In oh yeah, now? all over yeah, the place. We went to the University of South Carolina, and uh, it's funny because everywhere we've been on this last tour, we've run into some uh, Gamecock alumni. Yeah, we were like in Vancouver, Canada. You know, and there was somebody who went to South Carolina. There it was pretty wild. Mm -hmm. Find out in Europe how dedicated they yeah, really are. <laughs> we see how really tough they are when we go. Are there different places in different cities that you look forward to stopping at and eating too? Oh eating? yeah. I mean, Wow. Eating? Eating, yeah. Raleigh, North Carolina. Raleigh. Yeah. Clues. Clues. Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Pig pickings. Yeah, pig pickings. And barbecue. Yeah, New Orleans. Yeah. Peter's drink. Yeah, actually, where we play in New Orleans at Tipitina's. The, oh, uh, man, the food is They have good food there. there. Yeah, they, mix, they make jambalaya there. It's awesome. Yeah. Where else? There's well, probably several there's others. Several others there's a notice that we notice that we're still in the south. <laughs> yeah, well, the, no northern places really cook that well. <laughs> we, did, we went to Philly and got a Philly steak and cheese, and it, it was, was really, good. really good. But yeah, now they good. make those everywhere. So. <laughs> tell, tell me what it was like when you first started touring. What what was your transportation? And now that you guys have hit <laughs> at first, at, right now. at first it was his station wagon, his station wagon, and his car that we drove around in, and then uh, we bought a van and a. Uh, it was a two-seater with carpet in the back, and we put our equipment in the back, and three people, two, four people would lay on the back, <laughs> and two people would sit up, and you know, we just pray that our, we'd have a sudden stop, you know, and that bass app just flies down and breaks both your legs, you know. <laughs> we just prayed that never happened. We thought that was like luxurious though at the time. Oh, was, like, man. The big, it had carpet in the back, that was like all we needed. And it was a lot better than driving around in your wagon, you know. When we got that van, we were so happy, man. Yeah. It was just like, yeah. Any one yep. person had to drive is compared to three. <laughs> and then we got a, a nicer van, a custom van, and, and put a trailer on the back of it. And, and uh, that, that was, was real luxury there, boy. <laughs> and then uh, did that for a couple years. And, and, and then we put our EP Coochie Pop and it sold really well. So we got a, a brand new custom van with a Sega and everything in it. And a trailer on the back. <laughs> and that was cool. But now, you know, it's. Everything we did was like a step towards the bus. And finally, and we now the bus. To the and bus. I can guarantee you, I'm never touring without a bus ever again. <laughs> We like the bus better than planes, actually. <laughs> Ten oh, times like it's slow, but it's a lot easier. We like the bus so much that uh, <laughs> when we were in Vancouver, we were flying home, and Dean and I seriously thought about riding back in the bus for five days. <laughs> five thousand miles. <laughs> Would have slept better. Yeah, definitely. And uh, you guys have a very communal system, the way you run your business. Yeah. And, uh, a lot of musicians uh, 
find themselves sort of uh, out of luck in the business end of the music business. Mm -hmm. and tell us a little about how you guys are set up. Uh, for us, we were lucky because uh, Dean was a marketing finance major, and we got we ran into some really cool people to help us out. And you know, we just started our partnership, and then you know, it was the touring was doing well, and we were making some money, and it was you know, we had to start a corporation for da tax purposes and stuff. You know, we just set up a corporation years ago and we were getting health insurance and you know, weekly paychecks and that, that was just stuff that we knew, you know, if somebody got hurt, we'd be in trouble. You know, and it's like we see so many, we saw so many bands of our peers in the South, you know, who were taking the money at the end of the night and just putting it up like we do. But then if you take that month off, you'll get your money, you know, and for us it was like, you know, we knew when, if we did take a month off, we would all still get our paychecks and be able to pay our bills, so that was real important to us. Yeah, ever since we started making money, you know, Dean was always right on the ball about we you know we need to take care of the money so so that we won't owe taxes at the end of the year and down the road you know be broke so we've always kind of been in that philosophy of take care of the money you yeah. know right when you get it and that way yeah it would be better off later and since we started out a long time we are doing it that way it's it's been an easy progression you know it's not like we just had it all of a sudden had a bunch of money and had to take care of it we've been doing it for four or five years, so it's just been a, like a growth process. Yeah, all of our paychecks have gradually increased and our, the income for the corporations gradually increased, and so we've been able to stick with it pretty easily and keep taking care of it. And now, you know, it's like you, with the little bit of success we have, you know, it's like it may not last very long, so the money we are making we want to do the right thing with, you know, so we could take care of ourselves in the long run. And did having that organization help you after you recorded two albums, uh, Two albums on your own, and then actually three albums. On yeah, yeah. And then uh, signed on with Atlantic. And since you had had success on your own, did it help you uh, maintain uh, your guys' vision of the band and where it was? Going? Oh, unquestionably. Yeah, it definitely did. I mean, we knew what, we already knew what we wanted and how we wanted to do it. So just with Atlantic, as more or less, we had someone there to help us get to where we wanted to go. You know, we didn't really have to change our philosophy or anything, so that was cool. And, you know, it's like, you know, a lot of, I mean, for us, like like you said, you know, we had already had everything set up. So when, you know, Atlantic did come along, we did sign Atlantic and things did start going well, you know, we didn't freak out because it was just, it really wasn't, I mean, it was great, it was wonderful, it was what we wanted, but it wasn't something that would make us go, whoa, whoa, whoa you know, we got, you know, we want to go out and do this, we want to go out and do that. We already knew what we were doing, it just now we were doing it with more money and more, you know, playing more on a bigger level. Yeah, on a bigger level. So it's really nothing's really changed. We still play a lot, and you know, we still do the same things with what we have that we've done before. We just do it on a bigger scale. What were some of the thrills you guys have had in the last year? Le Letterman was definitely a thrill, just yeah. because you know our college career was, you know, two hours a night was spent around <laughs> Letterman. You know, the half hour before it came on, getting ready for it, and watching Andy Griffith. <laughs> yeah, watching Andy Griffith. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, it's been, a lot of that has been meeting, you know, meeting several people. Like we met a couple of the guys from R.A.M. Yeah, and Toad the Wet Sprocket playing with them was a playing with Toad the Wet Sprocket, yeah. and you know, people who we really looked up to, and and um, you know, artists and musicians that we really looked up to over the last four years or so, and actually getting to be on their level and play with them for for a night or two here and there. It's, that's just been a great thing for us. It's been really exciting. Yeah, it's like great. tonight playing with Victoria Williams and. Her husband's with the Jayhawks. It's going to be so much fun. He's going to be there playing. We're huge fans, so that's going to be really cool. And we got to have a bagel with uh, Regis Philbin. That Regis was my big moment. <laughs> Are there any bands that you'd really like to play with or meet in the near future? Yeah, I mean, I guess the one that we really wanted to play with you know, is Toad, and we're doing a tour with them in March and April. And uh, you know, we would, yeah, of course, we want to play with RM, but who in the country doesn't want to play with RM? You know? <laughs> I mean, I, I say sometimes in interviews, you know, when. Uh, I, if it wasn't for R.E.M., we wouldn't be a band, because there was one time in our set we were playing like nine R.E.M. songs. <laughs> and, uh, it's like, when we were a cover band. And now, <laughs> people liked us. <laughs> yeah, the, <laughs> now people don't like us anymore, but... Um, <laughs> oh, God, I, guess, I, I could go on forever. Yeah, there's a lot of... We John listen, Hyatt, I think, is somebody we yeah, like That's a big one, yeah. And we listen to a lot of music, and... Rodney, Rodney Foster, Foster yeah. we'd like to play with. I'd love to play with Stevie Wonder. Actually, uh, there's something specific about John Hyatt that relates to the latest release of this. Yeah, we uh, we named our, our record after a line in the John Hyatt song. The song was uh, "Learn How to Love You" off uh, off of uh, "Bring the Family," and uh, it was just a line that we were all sitting around in our uh, apartment out here in L.A. when we were recording the record, and we were, they told us to name the record, and that was just perfect. 
when, when, they, when he said that, we were all like, that, that's perfect. I can go to bed now. Correct. Yeah, well, that, was after, that was after four hours of, yeah, uh, of yeah, saying every, deliberation. Yeah, every time somebody said that, we're like, oh, how about, no, nah. no, nope, can't name it that. Okay. <laughs> and we finally ended up with Cracked Rear View, so just in case I figured I should mention it. <laughs> Is that what we called it? Good boy. I thought it was a three man and a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where did the name Hootie and the Blowfish come from? They always leave that one for me. Um, when I was in college, you know, Mark and I were the Wolf Brothers, and uh, we were about to start the band. And uh, when I was in college, I was kind of, a, I, I was a nice guy, but I was kind of a jerk in the way I gave people uh, nicknames all the time that they didn't like. And uh, one guy, I started calling him Hootie, so I, I sang in this little choir-like thing, so everybody started calling him Hootie, and because uh, he had really big eyes. And the other guy I had his friend just had huge cheeks, and I called him the Blowfish. And uh, one night I was at a party that that our thing was thrown, and uh, they walked in, and I said, "Look, Hootie and the Blowfish." And I said to Mark, I think the next day, I was like, Mark, we should name our band Hootie and Blowfish. Mark's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, but and we named it that with all intentions, all intentions of changing the name. But now, nine years later, we're still Hootie and the Blowfish. All right, I got a couple questions for you guys. You can cut for a second. I got a couple questions. One of the questions I'm going to ask you is, uh, how do you feel about being on a series? You don't have to rule them out. How do you, first question, how do you feel about performing with such diverse artists on the series. It's uh, it's really nice to play with such a like a diversity of artists on the show. I mean, we're we're huge Neville Brothers fans. I mean, that one of my disappointments yeah. in life is I've never seen them live. You know, it's it's kind of like I said before. The, a lot of these artists are people we've been listening to for years and and looked up to, and to be, you know, in this level with them, playing with them, it's just almost a dream come true. Yeah, for yeah us. like Victoria, who's on the left, you know, the John Hyatt. You know, level of songwriting. She's she's just an incredible songwriter. And you know, Cheryl. We, you know, we can't say too much about Cheryl. We love Cheryl. Uh, we play, we, we play. Hi, Cheryl. We play with her. It's us. We were both fish. Remember us, Orlando? How does she play? Well, I mean, it's it's honestly it's an honor. I mean, because you know, we are so we are so just us. I mean, uh, it's, how can I say this? We are so. <laughs> We're amazed by what's going on in our careers, and we just when 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 you say Cheryl Crow, or you say Victoria Williams, you say Neville Brothers, you know, you say those people. We don't consider ourselves in that category of of musician or or of entertainer. I mean, we're still just you know Hootie the Blowfish living in Five Points, Columbia, South Carolina, you know, going out to group every chance we get. You yeah. know, and it's just amazing to be asked to do something like this. Yeah, it's like when us. people people call up, you know, old friends, and they'll be like. So, you know, how's it feel? You're doing this, you're doing that, and it's like uh, I'm doing nothing's Gordon different. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same, same thing, you know, same person, same people, same friends. Except now no. the people that we haven't talked to in, in a year or two years are like, I think we're someone else. But other than that, it's, nothing's I mean, yeah. really changed, and, just him less. And that just gets to the point where it's really amazing to be on the same stage and on the same show as, those, as acts like that. These are people who sit home and hold their CD and look at the pictures and read the credits and say, wow, yeah. these guys yeah. are great. And now we're like sharing the same stage. I mean, it's we've been terrible. listening to Neville Brothers since oh. our first van. Never, yeah. <laughs> like, we've already lost. Neville, about that Nevelization CD. Yeah, we've already lost like three of their CDs. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Remember when Yellow Moon came out? Yellow Moon. Like, we let's do it like every day for six weeks. Or something. Funny, I got all those CDs now. Like, they're all fun. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys been... Over to the club, what do you think of the venue? Oh, the food's oh, fantastic. Yeah, it's really, really beautiful. It's, beautiful. Yeah. it's a great club. It's kind of between like a, a like a big theater type place, but it's got the energy of like a smaller club, bar. Because yeah. people definitely. are right up in the front and it's... It's definitely a club show too at the same time. We ate lunch out on the patio too. It's kind of it's like a beautiful view of Raleigh. Oh, it was oh, a really was nice day, so that was cool. Yeah. Good Very food, cool. too. Great food. It's a great, great building food. too, man. The only problem is they didn't have sweet tea. And it's supposed to be a southern restaurant. You know, you gotta have sweet tea. <laughs> You know, granted, this unsweet tea was very good, but they have do sweet need tea. Sweet. If, it's, if it's southern, it's got to have sweet Even tea. Even if you sell one cup of milk, I'm calling Dan. I'm offer. calling Dan Eckler as soon as we finish with this. Tell him you got to get some sweet tea in there. <laughs> <laughs> right, let me ask you guys one more question. You can cut the thing back for a second. And speed. Speed. Okay. Some of the things that you know we like to do, you know, to give it back to the people is uh, we do some charity work, whether it's just visiting people. You know that our fans are maybe uh, you know physically sick or something. Uh, we also donate money. We did a uh, a donation to the uh, Carolina Children's Home over Christmas. Uh, it was right before Christmas, and we donated money that we had won in the VH1 golf tournament 
and uh, it was really special for these kids, you know, to get something like this. They're, you know, working off, you know, public donations alone, and they don't have much money, and you know, if we can do something like that to give it back, it, it makes us feel good about what we're doing. Yeah, Sony's being modest, but he, like, he's organized a few shows that we've headlined that were just strictly for, we didn't, you know, we talked people in the, the donating everything, the, you know, the beer and the sound system and the venue and everything, just so we play the show and you know, give all the money to the Carolina Children's Home. We're going to see a, uh, a kid who's a big fan of ours who uh, is getting like his 15th leg operation and uh, he's, you know, he might lose his leg or whatever, and so we're going to see him uh, within the next couple of days uh, in a hospital that's kind of in between a couple of shows. We're going to pull the bus over and go and see him. and and uh, just maybe sign some other autographs for kids in the hospital that want to say hi and stuff like that. So we could try to keep up with that sort of thing. I think a lot of people think that, you know, they, they would call us and ask us to do things and we wouldn't do it. But, you know, if, if we have time to, even if it's just five minutes to do something, you know, it's, it's an honor for people, for somebody, from, for some kid in the hospital to say, you know, I want to see Hootie and the Blowfish. It's, it's an honor and I would go see any time I'm in a dead city, I'd go see that person. Yeah, I don't think uh, our self-importance hasn't risen to that level yet where we feel we're, you know, not special enough to take time out to go see people. And, uh, and hopefully it never will. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're still, we're that way in a lot of ways, even like when we have a show and it sells out. Um, and then there's like, you know, we've had a couple shows where there's been like 500 people in line or 400 people in line. And they weren't going to get in. And they're not going to get in, so we'll like take our acoustics out of the bus and go out there and, you know, play a little show for a half hour. And it's not, I mean, it's not much, but it's, it's you know, we think it's kind of cool to be able to thank them for, uh, you know, supporting us even though they didn't get to come in, so. By the way, we got that idea from Steve Wynn. Yeah, we did. <laughs> 